Chris, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy man, and I know there are so many things going on. Um, I want to thank you for this amazing book. It was, it's my second time that I'm reading it, and actually I can see now where all this force uh, is coming from. Well, thanks, Rocco. I'm glad you uh, took the time, and I'm glad it had an impact on you. That's uh, really the point of why I took the time to, to share that story with people is to articulate uh, those messages and pass along a little bit of maybe inspiration, motivation, whatever you call it in the process. In many ways, um, I, I, to start, I really enjoyed how you started your book about your father, father and all the, the actual messages you're trying to, um, first of all, take away all your uh, hardship and then try to implement in a, not in such a raw way, but try to implement to your family. Um, what's harder? Is it harder keeping uh, three kids, if I'm not mistaken, and that kind of an actual path or that crazy deadlift and squat that you did for three reps? Uh, it all flows together. So yes, you're right. Three kids. Uh, and as you know, from uh, reading the book, I also uh, had a little bit of experience uh, parenting um, before that, raising my three younger sisters. Was, so we got out of the, the environment that we were in. But, you know, the, the things that I do, I'll, I express this in, the, in kind of the intro in the book, though, is, is it, for me, it is all about setting that example to my children. The best thing that I can do as a parent is try to show them that you can walk in this world however you choose to, that you can create it around you, you can create the environment, you can make change, you can leave it the way that you choose to leave it. And by leave it, I'm not talking about passing on. I'm talking about having a lasting impact beyond your years. And so uh, that is the, I could talk about it. I could talk philosophy. I could be a dreamer, all those sorts of things. But the best way that I can do that is showing them by example. And I don't know what path they're going to follow, where they're going to want to go. But all I can do is try to empower them to feel that they, they can go there. I did that because my dad did that. And that's, yeah, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to, to, to leave them with. And so, so, yeah, all the crazy things that I do uh, via lifting, business, everything is all part of, for me, part of that, that parenting thing. I see a, a lot of people in kind of this day and age, they try to be anything, everything, everywhere and everything for their children, but at the same time, lose themselves. And what does, what does that, you know, do for your children saying, well, all you're going to get to do to explore your life is just this short period of time before you start your own family. And then you're subjugated to not, you know, that, that becomes the, the child is the, the center in the role. And obviously I treat and elevate my kids as best I can, uh, to an incredible level, anybody that follows my life uh, on social media, but there's a distinct difference of understanding that that does not mean that it is the end of chasing your life, that the only reason you're doing those things is uh, for, so that you could be there for them. Well, there's a lot more ways of being there for your kids that are going to have a bigger impact on on their life than that. How close is that to actual coaching and actual doing what you do because what I find wonderful is, you know, uh, co-created Kabuki, um, and you can see that you've got a mission, and you are a man uh, of a mission. And I can see that it's strength, it's education, it's assessing. I love the charity work you're doing. 
you've created a wonderful community and you create a solid foundation. And one thing I, I love that you actually do is, and that's what I want to dig deep in, is you're, you're, you're re- one of the strongest people out there. And you rarely talk about strength. You talk always about all the foundation behind that, which are so many other pillars of creating those three reps for a thousand pounds and all those innovating uh, coaching or manufacturing or educational um, subjects creating or um, products. What are all these foundations you think to be complete? Because you talk about parenting, which in order to bring something out, you need to be complete. You need to be a whole, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to do that in another area, what are the major pillars that we should focus on? So there's, there's a lot that you covered there and I'm just going to kind of take what I took from the message, which is uh, really from that parenting side, you're really talking about in business or wherever is more of that uh, leadership and coaching and how does that relate to what you do in parenting? And honestly, I think they're, they're a little bit different, distinctly different in fact, because with those things, with, you know, leadership as an, as an adult, uh, as either a coach, as a business owner, all these sorts of things, you have an established mission and goal for you and what you're trying to accomplish. Right. And your goal is to attract people that want to be a part of this energy that you're creating in this change that you're creating in the world. And that's a powerful thing. That's a foundationally, you're talking about how do you create something that does amazing things? Well, that, that's it. That's how we've created Kabuki strength. We don't hire people. So Rocco, you've had the chance to, uh, to virtually meet some of our other, our oh, team yeah. members. And you see, we've have just this incredible level of talent and passion. It's funny. I, I, I rolled in this weekend on a, on a Saturday just before Christmas and the parking lot's full. Nobody asked anybody to come into work. This is just people love what they're doing and they're in doing what they, they love doing because they're trying, we're trying to change the world for the better in the way that we can and how foundationally, like you can talk about lots of different strategic, uh, you know, policy deployment and other strategies, business strategies, people employ like, the foundation is you've got to have something that people connect to. You've got to be able to articulate that message, right? And you've got to be able to draw people to be part of that. And then from there, you know, what is the coaching part? What is the leadership part? Well, the coaching is getting people to reach beyond where they thought their, their expectations, their limits were, right? And so this is about getting people to be able to step into this area of unknown, this area of uncertainty, this, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can pull that off and expressing, I believe in you. Okay. And this is clearly painting that picture of where we're going. This is how you fit in. And I want you to walk into this area full, well knowing that you're unsure whether you're going to walk out successful on the other side of that, but I believe you are going to, right? And then as they do that, that's where true like motivation, buy-in, change as an individual happens when you, when you're willing to walk into this, this unknown project, this unknown uh, training goal, this unknown, whatever it is that you're unsure about. And and learn and discover about yourself in the process that you're able to step up to those challenges. You're able to learn, you're able to persevere and overcome. Those are some foundational things. So there's a lot of things I just covered there. Now, the later half of that is something that you would do in parenting. The, the first half of that is, is not because your child needs to find over their own life their own mission, their own passion, the, the, those things. You're not going to say, this is what, what uh, how you need to live. This is what you need to accomplish. And unfortunately, going, going back to parenting, you see a lot of that happen with people. Uh, a lot of people, you need to chase, you need to be the football star because that's what I always wanted to be and didn't pull it off. You need to be, you know, you need, work, our you need to work. You need to work in the family trade of being a physician. You need to, and, and that's not 
uh, appropriate in my mind. Like that is, that is where you spend that time from your teen through, you know, maybe up to your thirties or so on, like figuring out like who you are in the world and where you want to go. And so you can help understand what are the parameters, you know, and setting, setting those boundaries as a parent of like what's acceptable and what's not. <laughs> and being congruent with their own values, right? So yes, help them understand their values, but the output of how they're going to express that is another thing. And that is for them to discover. Um, and, but you're still going to do the piece of helping, pushing them uh, and being supportive and confident in the process, but also letting them know as they fail in the process that they are not a failure, that they need to come back around and they can be successful. It's just, maybe you need to try harder. Maybe you need to try a different way. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to gain some education, some experience that this is something that takes time. It's not like, so this is, <clears throat> Those are the things that you're going to do. And that is, so there's certain pieces of that process that are going to be, that are essential in being a coach or a mentor as an adult, as being a business owner, leader, entrepreneur, that you're not going to do that aspect with your child. You shouldn't. Yes. And that's a good segue because I, I always start with, if there's not philosophy in your training, your coaching, um, that you're not going to get anywhere because we always get tangled up with, you know, should I do this program or should I do the other one or why well, I'm not getting, you know, strong. And I always try to say to people that I mentor or some of my athletes, like I always need to find the buy-in in order for them to actually build trust in order to build on their goal and what challenges they've got. Cause it's going to be numerous challenges. Absolutely. <laughs> Show me a life or a process worthy of uh, walking through that doesn't have like incredible challenges that you don't know that you're going to be able to get through. And that's the window of growth. Show, show me, show me one. Otherwise, <laughs> it ain't. It's not of the level that we're talking about. That's the most important. You, you uh, a story of strength and reinvention. I like that so much. Reinventing yourself because that's the purpose, right? To actually clear up all the. Uh, biases and all the manifestos and all the dogmas that were, you know, were poured into us and try to find actually who we really are. Yeah. And, and that's really, so the book is two pieces and it's really relevant to what I just went through. This also separation of childhood and, you know, adult business coaching. However, it's the, it's the same philosophy, right? So the first half of the book is, is a story of strength. It's a story of understanding that you are separate from your environment, that you're defined by your actions and responses to the things that happen to you and not necessarily those things themselves. They may influence and they're going to have an influence on you, but they are not the thing that defines oneself. And it's really finding what your strengths are and really what you can accomplish in this world based on those, based on those strengths, those attributes, those passions that you have. The second half of the book is more of that other discussion that we just had, which is specifically deciding like in this world, who do I want to be? It is the purposeful reinvention. It is the purposeful or invention of, of oneself. So it is the specifically deciding who and how you want to be in this world and becoming that person. And that's the, the second half of the book. And I don't have the answers and I don't guide anyone or tell anyone what those are in the book. I don't, I, I can't, I can't attempt to know what that is for you, but what I can do is help guide you on a path of introspection that's going to help you get there and then hopefully provide you some, some words and encouragement to, uh, to inspire some motivation. And, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. Rocco, like the responses that I've gotten from people, like the impact that it's had on their lives and that like people have completely like reevaluated, made major change. I mean, it's just, it, it's insane. The, the feedback that I've gotten either online messages, eat people that have taken the time to fill out the answers at the end and email me. Uh, 
and just their personal story about the profound impact that it has had on some people. Like I, I put this little tagline on, you know, my social media, here's a book that'll change your life. Cause, but you hear that all the time. I know everybody reads that and goes, ah, yeah, whatever mm-hmm. cliche, you know, and for some people it's not going to that that's fine, but it really hits home with a lot of people in a way that they did not expect. It did with me, and I'm not going to lie, uh, I, it's one of the Christmas gifts that I'm, I'm sending to a lot of my athletes and clients, that they think about what challenge is, and when I say, you know, you want to reinvent yourself, and I just put a wish in, Merry Christmas, and I hope you reinvent yourself, and I send them your book, because it changed me uh, in numerous ways, and how actually uh, our true liberty is on how we act in circumstances and not react, which is the animal inside. So you take whatever comes and you're trying to make it a solution to challenge you and make you better. And that will help you leave a better world and make it. Absolutely. Yep. Regarding you said about coaching before, and I, you've been out there for many, many years. What are the, the things you, in coaching that you see now, you, you say like, these things need to change. What are the, like some, let's say coaching mistakes and, and strength that you see that you said, you, you know, we need to put a delete on that. I, uh, I don't know that I could answer the, I specifically what I would say I'd need to change or what's wrong. I, I started this process more than a decade ago on my YouTube channel when I was a nobody because I got so frustrated about looking out there and seeing what was happening in the coaching, in the training world. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just going to start filming these, you know, mini talks that I give at the, at the gym I have with my athletes and post them online. And hopefully it, you know, it reaches some people because I was just so disgusted. Now the environment, you know, in 2010 for training was entirely different than it is now. And there's a lot of people listening to this that aren't going to have any clue as to what I'm talking about. And it's not necessarily a where we're at now, but it's, it is honestly really crazy when I reflect back on it. And where we've come so far, there's still so far to go, but things like breathing and bracing mechanics, uh, how the foot is the, the importance in the kinetic chain, like just some base level fundamental stuff. Those discussions were not even had. These things that now we look at in their ubiquitous in the industry. It's like, find me a coach that doesn't at least can, can't parrot, you know, some of those sayings and doesn't parrot them with your clients. Now, the true understanding of the nuance That's and what <laughs> happens is still really lacking uh, as, as a whole. But this really fundamental, where do we start from peace? It was, it wasn't there. And in fact, we were actually coaching people entirely wrong. We were coaching people into bad and broken backs. We were coaching people into hip replacements. We were coaching like, this is what was expected if you've been in the strength game for any period of time. And all those old coaches and old athletes, people will call me out every now and again, well, so-and-so doesn't say that. And I'm like, well, where are they at right now? Where are their athletes at right now? Oh, like, (laughs) but so this very rudimentary approaches that we see throughout the industry, those weren't even happening. And so I, I know I sound egotistical kind of saying, you know, find me the first person that was talking about it and posting videos and, and, and promoting these, these concepts. And it's going to be right here. A hundred percent. Okay. Some of the movements and things that we, you know, it's that from there, same thing. I was very early in this approach and can I take responsibility for how, how large it's impacted the industry at this point? Probably not. Right. But without a doubt, I was the first major person in this besides, you know, maybe some, you know, obscure physician or somebody, you know, working somewhere talking with their clients around these discussions. Nobody of any relevance was having a voice around these topics. And now it has become ubiquitous in the industry. It's becoming so, because you, why you, you settled 
in a way, because I remember one of the talks you did with a common friend and uh, one amazing uh, scientist, uh, Dr. McGill. And I remember when you had that podcast and you're the person that lifted that amount of weight. So by bridging, you know, the signs. And, and, that's, and that's why I was like, that's what I need to do. I need to walk the walk and be and able to show walk. people that what you can do. And I, and I, you know, putting this stuff in place, I huge, I, I made huge impacts in my personal performance. And at the same time, people don't realize like overcoming that prior, I was a person that had major disc damage that I had to learn to walk again. I've got long lasting nerve damage, like all those things that, that, are a result of those prior methods of, you know, arch hard, sit back, you know, uh, all sorts of broken down mechanics. And so how I arrived there was actually reaching out to a lot of these obscure people at the time uh, on the clinical, on the research side and really diving into depth on clinical continuing education at the time, because it was the only place that was just talking about these topics. Unfortunately, I would sit through, God, <laughs> yeah, like a series of six two day lectures on from, from some high level developmental kinesiologists on how the diaphragm works in the pelvic floor. And you're just like every day, your mind's whirling and you're like, it took me a couple of years really to digest that down into some usable nuggets that people can take action on. Here's five steps to put in place. Boom, 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 to, to prepare this entire kinetic chain for under load and how we manage it and you simplify, it. Sim simplify it. Like simplifying exactly. things are not, not easy. No, so now no. it gets down to this really basic approach and, and people are like, well, that's so simple. You're just talking and base. I'm like, it, yeah. You, not see yeah. What's in the background. I, I, you should have seen where it came from. But, <laughs> so, so we look at things from an assessment standpoint and we do it. My approach has always been under load because even when I start working with these high level people, they'll say and talk and do assessments and test. And it's all these positional and non-loaded states. And I'm like, you're not doing what you say you're doing. I'm like, yeah, I am. I'm like, here, grab a bar. And let's see what happens. I'm like, look, you're breaking. You don't, until you actually discover failure or close to failure, you're not going to find when you're really doing something or not. So there's two areas, there's two areas that's going to happen. That's going to happen under close to maximal load and close to maximal fatigue, right? So this is the area where we need to understand where we're doing it and be able to actually focus on it. And at the time people were saying, well, you know, you're not going to be able to think, don't do, you know, anything goes when you're under the bar, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no, it, it does. And we can make this happen. And when you do that, that's where magic happens. This is the balance of extremes. I expect you to put a hundred percent in. You can't go over a hundred, but I, every last ounce of nugget, the 99, 90, but I also expect it to be freaking perfect. And people could hit, couldn't translate that those go together, but let's get back to, to base level assessment, right? So I look at things, what's going to be the largest goal, global impact to the body first. So this is how our assessment process, this is where our priorities come from. Yeah. Where do I, where do I go to first? I've got some sort of thing going on in the peripheral. I'll walk in somebody and somebody's like, man, how do you help this person with this, this dorsiflexion? They've got them strapped to a rack with a band around something and doing all these where I'm trying to fix because it's having a huge impact on their squat. And I'm like, well, let's get them into the bar. Let's go back to the bar. Okay. We're going to do, you know, a couple, you know, 90 second uh, dissertations on diaphragm and rib cage uh, uh, positioning, how to brace. We're going to catch a, catch a couple of sequence. And then all of a sudden we see, wow, that issue just went away. Well, we got to start with the basics first. Am I always going to jump right to those things immediately when watching an athlete? No, I'm, I may not because I've been doing this a long time and any co coach is going to, and they're going to be able to visually see some of those check those boxes but it doesn't mean that they haven't checked those boxes first this is the thing you have to check those boxes exactly first okay basic. so managing spinal mechanics has the largest global impact on the body 
This is simple, right? So if I'm trying to look at what's happening at the shoulder, it doesn't matter if I'm, (laughs) it's going to be very different based on how I position the scapula as it relates to the, I hate the word core, but uh, (laughs) torso, whatever, as it relates to spinal position and stabilization. It can be all over the place. So we can't even look at those things until we start here. And then it goes beyond those simple uh, mechanical positions, right? So obviously things that are going to happen downstream at the foot within like all those things are going to be greatly influenced by what happens at the spine position. So if I manipulate the spinal position, it's going to influence and put things in a position that they may or may not need to be upstream and downstream, which makes things maybe matter. Maybe they don't matter anymore. The other thing that we're going to have, exactly. The other thing that we're going to have is the impact, uh, you know, neuromuscular as in the fact of we have, if we lose stability, if we don't have stability somewhere, the body does a great job of compensating and those compensations come into play by restricting. Okay. They're going to create tightness to limit range of motion around a joint to protect a joint. Right. You don't have tight hips from squatting. I say this all the time. I I think other people probably say it right now. Uh, You don't have tight hips from squatting. You have tight hips from squatting like shit, okay? There's something that's happening within your pattern that is causing your body to go, hey, we're not in good position. There's risk. And because of that risk, we're going to detune the system. And the system is detuned by limiting power output and range of motion. That is simple. And you know what? We copy this same stuff into actual engineering design of the most, you know, highly complex systems out there from high-end supercars to probably the one that you drive to fighter jets, all these, we have the same exact systems in place that we build into these things. We do it the same thing. We've got this powertrain, power output system, this, you know, the muscles are going to be, you know, the engine, the transmission, and then, you know, but we also have a nervous system. We've got sensors all over the place. We've got a computers. I think there's like 20 computers plus computers in modern cars nowadays, looking at everything that's going on, right? And if that vehicle senses that you're slipping, going around a corner because we're on a little bit of ice and it's unstable, it doesn't magically send power to the tires that are, that are group still gripping and pull them off of the ones that no, what it does is it detunes the power output immediately. It retards the timing on the engine. It reduces the shift patterns on the transmission. So they don't shift his heart. It puts you in limp mode. Okay. It reduces your power output, right? It's the same exact systems that our body does as well, because it, works. It's very simple mechanism. Okay. If you're you're not in a position to, to really fire on all, all cylinders. Okay. The body's going to try to protect you. And that's where we look at these things as like, Oh, you have to do your mobility work. You have to do all this other stuff. And it's like, if you're doing that stuff and I do it too, because guess what? Nobody's, nobody's perfect. Like we all have subtle compensations all over the place. Right. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't do it, but recognize that if you're doing this, having to do the same thing over and over and over again, that there is something fundamentally wrong and you need to dive back to your assessments. If you don't understand why that's happening, why do I have to constantly, you know, open up my scapula before I squat because I've got tightness in my elbow when I'm got the bar on my back. There's a reason. Okay. And it's not because I have to, I skip this exercise that I have to do first. That's what I always say. Cause people come as like, Oh, we need to spend a lot of time into our, um, um, you know, uh, start being flexible. And I said, you don't wake up one day and like it's it, up. There's, there's a, there's you a don't, exactly. There is something that drove that. And I'm not saying don't clean it up. And, and then again, before your next workout, don't clean up. You've got to do that stuff. But fundamentally understand there is something wrong in two areas. Okay. There's something either wrong with your movement or there's something wrong with your training plan. Okay. Okay. All right. Understand that. Okay. 
work on fixing the issues so that you can continue to train pain-free and move and get the joints in great position, but try to figure those things out. Okay. And it's going to be constant loom. This is a forever, this is, this is the art of coaching is chasing that or clean that up. And then maybe something else is happening as you've, as you've moved into a new phase of training, a new season, a new competitive environment and so on. So first in our global priorities is the spinal mechanics. Okay. The second is going to be in the foot and ankle complex. It has the second largest impact on the body. Okay. So we're going to go right there next. All right. I may be having an issue upstream, you know, at a shoulder, in a hip, wherever it's going to be. I have to check these boxes first. You have to check those boxes and you'd be amazed. When I started talking foot mechanics, nobody was talking foot mechanics at the time. Maybe even the uh, barefoot, uh, when you started talking about barefoot and how about the hallux, how important it is. And you were talking about more than 10 years ago. Yeah. And people are like, oh, you just twist the ground. You it, like, no, it's, it's a little bit more complex than, than that. So there's nuance with a lot of this stuff. And this is the things I think people are still getting wrong. Cause they are like, I've got that nailed. I do this. And I'm like, I can't tell. All right. I can tell you, uh, that nearly everyone that thinks they have it does not. Okay. That includes myself, by the way. Um, look it's at my video. That's the thing. When you've got a different individual, even yourself, depending on the weight, things change. You know it better. <laughs> yep. Like, so it's going to be different if you have 500 pounds. It could be different if it's 700 pounds. Different. That's what when people say posture doesn't play a role. And I, I get seriously, like, I think I, I, I might get a stroke when I hear that. Um, oh, I, it's like, well, it, and it, let's get back to that argument. Like, it doesn't, but it does, okay? So posture and st being able to control and manage spinal ah. mechanics does. Yeah. And yeah. to do that, to, opt to make that happen to its fullest, you have to have those good positional, yeah. but just having them doesn't do anything either. So if yeah. I don't, ha it, 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 it doesn't matter. I can move my spine and I can pick up loads, right? And if I, if I take a person that knows how to, to stabilize their spine and I have them do the Jefferson curl, the multi-segmental spine, you know, deadlift to failure, which is poor spinal mechanics, they're going to have less risk of injury and perform better than a person that has a neutral spine position, but does not know how to engage the stabilization okay. process effectively. Okay. So the studies are like, well, it doesn't matter. Well, <laughs> I just gave you two examples of I could coach one athlete that has horrible, but now if I take an athlete that can manage those spinal positions and we get in good position, they're going to have incredible stabilization and they're going to blow these other two out of the water. Like, like they're like, like they're babies. Like it. So, so it, there's some, con there's some context when somebody says it doesn't matter. Like, I don't want to make people fearful. The, the no, argument the yeah. other way is because people are like, Oh, you're making people fearful of, it's got to be perfect or you're going to blow your spine out your back. You're going to be fearful of movement. You're going to be fearful of training. Uh, we can instill this. And these are the discussions that you need to have as a coach. We're seeking this area of perfection. We're not going to be there. The goal of doing and being in these positions is so that we can accomplish these things. And that's why it's important. But if you're a little out, it's, it's, it's new, it, it's a range, right? And so is, is it going to be the end of the day? No, but we're, we're not going to stop training today because of it, unless it is in a risk category and you should be able to see that as a coach. We're going to manage it and we're going to work towards perfection. The next rep, the next set, the next, next training session, the next season, so on. But it isn't something that we should be instilling you know, fear of movement in that, oh, this horrible thing's going to happen. So I understand the argument on the other side, but when so people, stressed. but, but the same thing, you know, the people that say that argument get what I'm saying right now, but the people that are the disciples of that are out there going, 
they don't understand that again, nuance, that context, and they're just parroting those. It doesn't matter. And you're a moron. The research says this, yeah. like, Oh my Usually God. Usually those people haven't worked with uh, people in, uh, with pain. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yep. like, the, the beauty of like, I can take somebody that can be on a level eight in pain, make it dissipate and have them load and squat and be doing this all in yeah. one session. Yeah. Right. I can take somebody that's, you, you know, going to be tears almost in their eyes to just bend over and pick up something off the floor because of the amount of pain that they're in, get them out of that pain and have them deadlifting a, a 30, 45 pound kettlebell off the floor at a level two, like this, by putting this stuff in place. And you go, well, it doesn't matter. It does, okay? But it's a matter of putting all of it together. If we're just answering the statement of, does spinal mechanics matter? In and of itself, no, not so much. <laughs> but, but, but when we combine it with our ability to actually engage the musculature in a manner that can stabilize stuff, and now we try working that together, oh, we're having a different discussion. So now we've covered the base level of things around, you know, here's the priority system. Okay. Number one, number two, the foot. Then we get into the big power generators next, which would be the, uh, the, the, the hip complex and the shoulder complex. All right. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Neither one has a higher priority to me. It depends on the activity, the goals, like all those sorts of things. And then we start getting out into the peripheral, uh, and almost always anything related to a knee, elbow, wherever, unless it's traumatic pain from existing from a hitting something wrong as you're running and tweaking or getting hit by a car, like it's a result of something else in the prior discussions first, right? We need to go back. So, exactly. uh, and, and that's honestly, this is the system that we use and how we develop the strength tools and things that we have, right? This is how we can take. That's a Cadillac. The block, the foundation of how right. we get a, a person or an athlete in order to solidify that. How do we exceed the biological capacity now? Yeah, so that's, that's the second piece of what we do at Kabuki. So the first is coaching and education, right? You've got to have this stuff first. But if I go, well, everybody uses a barbell. It's fundamental. This is, we use a standard barbell for everything. There is no other way. Okay. I get where the argument comes from because base level fundamental strength training stuff works. And the people that get into the, out into the, 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 the gimmick, the next best thing, the, this and that, they lose those fundamental, they work loading movements, basic loaded movements, work when you put in together great coaching and education, they deliver results, you get things working together. I don't need to do a suspended something with a band pulling in this. You're, 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 you're too smart for yourself. Oh yeah, whatever you want to tell yourself. So that's where this fundamental, like gotta, gotta, gotta train this it's old school. It's the only way. Well, yeah, I agree. But let's take a little bit closer look to that. The straight barbell does not put us in great joint positions for every movement in the world, okay? And so if I compromise the position of a joint, it's going to have an impact on being able to manage those positions that we just talked about, right? So we can take things and try to remove what I call these negative stressors. They're putting you in a position that doesn't provide an adaptive response to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we remove those one, now we can move better. Maybe we can engage a longer range of motion. Maybe we can, uh, be sorry, more efficient. Exactly. I can end up adding more load or maybe not even more load, but I can add more volume. I can add more frequency because if I'm always got this shoulder crank, there's only so much back squatting I can talk. I, I, I can tolerate, right? It becomes so much harder because that bar is always trying to throw me into extension. So I'm trying to fight it. I am constantly fighting at this, this shoulder and putting this strain on, on that. Those are going to be the things that actually end up limiting your training. And then it ends up being, well, now it's fatigued and not in a good way before your other sessions that are maybe pressing 
you know, because uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, ba- I'm a baseball player, football player. I've got to be able to have this shoulder back behind, you know, the torso to be able to start generating power back here. But now I'm, I'm fatigued. I've applied stress. So this gets us in the position of removing those negative stresses can be incredibly additive. What happens if I add more frequency? If I add more volume? Well, if I'm able to pack more of that into uh, a, a shorter tra- training window or within the same training window, I'm going to end up with more results. I'm going to end up over the season or the course of the training block to be stronger, to be faster going into the next one. This is really valuable. This is incredibly valuable. This is the focus of strength training as a whole. So we take those understanding of the biomechanics that we have and we go, what are the gaps that we have in the industry? And so this is like, I can take the Cadillac bar. We've got so many people. I'm going to tell the story of introducing it to major league baseball. I, I had the idea floating around my head for, I don't know how long, but we were going to, meet with all the major league baseball teams spring training in Arizona. And I love this because they're all around in these, this one town and they're spread around. So I can usually meet about three teams a day. And so it was out presenting and selling the trap bar, which is huge in major league baseball. I think only three teams don't use it. And I'm like, well, I'm going to take this prototype down there and get some feedback from the coaches because Here's the thing. I've, under, I've, I've learned that basically every head strength coach for a major league baseball team has a bad shoulder and they can't bench. Just like mm. that, that, not every, but you know, 50% of them. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a thing. I don't know. So I go in and I'm like, hey, I want you to try this bar. And I'm there with their staff and they're like, I, you know, I can't bench. I haven't, same story with like this repeated over and over again. I haven't benched for years. I can't even take an empty bar to my chest without, without pain. Man, I really miss benching. I want to I wanna be able to do it. I'm like, here, try, try this bar. Ooh, that feels good. So understand, this bar has an extra three inches range of motion on it than a standard barbell. But what we've done with it is actually tweak the hand position um, so that we've got really great bias of internal and external rotation, leaving just a hair bit left of external uh, rotation that can be had so you can engage the, still engage the musculature towards external, um, but having really great balance. And that position changes actually the, as you go in or out on the bar, because the wider your grip is, the difference of bias to internal and external rotation, right? The other thing that we did is stabilize it on the wrist. So every other multi-grip bar has the weight on the same plane as the handle, which is basically a teeter-totter because it's it off, off of, it's not in parallel with the, uh, the same axis as the weight. So it's, a, it's teeter-totter. And what does that mean? It's infinitely perfect to find a balance point. You can't find it. That's why you walk into a playground. A teeter-totter is always sitting on one end or the other. That's the whole, like, that's what a teeter-totter does, right? (laughs) So essentially you can never be balanced. And so people with those uh, multi-grip bars, if you watch them bench, they always choke up their hands on one side because as soon as you try to take them out of a rack, it tries to teeter into your face and crush your crush your nice grill or your nose. And so you know that, so you kind of prep for it. We just expect, like you start thinking about that. There's so many things in the strength world with the equipment that we use. We just, we accept the inadequacies and we just move forward. Like this is a known thing. Which is ludicrous, right? It's ludicrous, right? So if I take the, the, the center of mass and put it below our center of rotation, okay, we have a swing. We have... Where does a swing go? It always is finding center. In fact, you have to push your child to make it work because it's going to automatically not, and then we have to teach them to move their legs to, so that it can actually work because it's always trying to find center. We put the weight below it, okay? Which is why it's arced, which yeah. happens to be able to get us our greater range of motion because now you'll find out what happened when I went to, to, to spring camp wow, that, that feels good. They're scared of it at first because it's like this extra range of motion is like, that's the last thing you want when you, when you experience pain. Like put a plate on there. They bench a plate for a few reps. Man, that feels good. Their staff's all starting to look around at each other like, what is going on here? Put another plate on there. 
<laughs> pump out five reps, get up, just this glowing smile on their face. And they're We're back. And they're like, Hey, uh, how'd that feel? How bad did it hurt? Like, there was no pain. It felt great. That's incredible. We just took somebody that can't bench a bar to their chest without pain, hasn't been able to train for years, and now they're doing reps with two plates on a bar. So uh, 100 kilo for uh, our, our, our UK uh, folks, you know, 225 pounds uh, over here in the US uh, for, for reps. And this was repeated over and over and over again. Why does this happen? Well, some of the things that we just happened, we talked about, but we've got this incredible stack that we have created of all the joints on top of each other and getting the joints in the right position. And all of a sudden these subtle little details, this bar that looks almost like everybody else's, but it's slightly arc, like go that changes the game that dramatically and but you know you combine that so it's 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 taking these things that we see from an education and coaching principle and movement movement and loading principle first going on for so many years you said no we need to find a solution (laughs) to that and you did it and so so that's that's where our product design comes from is seeing those gaps and that's why it's like we don't sell anything and everything Uh, we sell things that have a purpose and make a change in this industry and I'm slowly, slowly working my way through this complete gym because I, there's still so much opportunity in how we manage and position the barbells and other things, uh, these core fundamental tools. So I'm all like core fundamental strength training stuff. Like you got a bar, you got some handheld weights, you got some things to manipulate and hold these things in place. These deliver results, okay? Not some sort of fancy whatever that's going to be out of style in two years, but everybody, everybody needs uh, stuff, but it doesn't mean that there can't be opportunities for improvement and tremendous opportunities for improvement. Yeah. The transformer bar. Oh, uh, it's awesome. the only bar in the world I can manipulate. Guess what? Oh. Everybody has different torso lengths, right? Different, uh, different femur lengths, different, like all these things. And they all add up. There is nothing that says, well, everybody, everybody in the world needs to be able to do a squat. Well, yeah, without, you know, any sort of handicap or something like that. That's a true statement. This is a basic natural human fundamental movement. Now saying that with an, with a load placed at a very specific point in the body, <laughs> Game that, that's a different, <laughs> not everybody's built to do a barbell back squat to given set a range of motion and be able to be maintain the integrity of those positions and not struggle to, to, to manage it and be able to have their training volume or intensity or frequency reduced as a result of it. Well, how about we change the, open up the ability to change the position of the load. And here's the, the thing that people may not realize as they're doing it is you're actually not changing the position of the load. The load's always still in. This is basic physics is staying above the mid foot. You can't put the load way in front of you. <laughs> don't, you, you don't actually do that because uh, that's why telephone poles have two arms on them to hold yeah. the wires because off of one, if we load it up too much, it falls over. Okay. Uh, and that's why they're sunk into the ground because they wouldn't, they would definitely fall over. Right. We're not sunk into the ground. We're standing on it. So what we're doing is actually moving the spine around the load. So we're changing the spine's relation and we're actually moving that load around. Yeah. Uh, or yeah, moving the spine around the load and it's relation to the hip joint. That's so incredibly powerful. Especially for tall individuals, which, you know, if you have basketball players, for example, that's a game changer because with a... Just- they can't. That, uh, that's why we're in, in the U.S. We're in 90% of major league sports. Why? Because a lot of those are the outliers. They're the people like, I'm sorry. You know, if you're six, five, seven foot, you know, seven foot plus, or again, like major league baseball, they're going to have different limb links, torso links than uh, some of the standard average population, right? They're not going to be the ones that can really squat well 
uh, let alone everybody can use opportunity because just this, that weird placement, that's just where a bar sits, right? That's not actually, our load is actually will be naturally centered at the shoulder mass. But uh, if you're picking something up more like a deadlift, but anyway, um, the, we can, those populations are hugely affected by it. Go oh, and go peruse social media and watch some of those athletes and you'll see people ripping them apart because they don't know how to lift. They are athletes. They are moving better than nearly anyone out there for their mechanics. Exactly. So you, they're not ever able to, to perform a back squat as well as this, Olympic, Olympic, this Olympic lifter that, you know, what, it, what is the average height of a, you know, a, a, a successful Olympic lifter? It's probably around five, seven or something. Eight, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Five, eight, somewhere in that range. And you're going to find the same thing in powerlifting as well, uh, because those are the ones that are going to be able to get in those positions and be able to maintain the spinal mechanics to the best, which is going to allow them over time to be able to train harder than, than everyone else and be able to recover from it. Like, <laughs> Oh, all the things we've talked about, right? Which, which is again, the same thing. Cause I, I had a lot of questions when I said, Oh, we're going to have this chat. And it's like a lot of people said, can you ask him, how can we get to a thousand pound deadlift for three or a squat? And I, and I said, I'll ask him, but there's so many different variables that it's not like besides training, right? It's structure. It's your genes. There's so many other, so, so many things. Yeah. So you have to have great genetics. You got to have for recovery. You've got to have, uh, you've got to have great mechanical leverages. And this includes attachment points at the bone. Different people will be able to generate different force based on, based on that. Uh, you're going to have to have the right ability to generate the, the mindset and you're going to have to have training that matches all these variables, right? So one of the things that I'm a huge believer in, and that is uh, using both subjective and objective training. You can't just take a training plan that worked for such and such athlete and copy it. Okay. We actually have to, there's life factors that are going on at the same time uh, that are all going to affect your recovery rates. Okay. It all is coming from the same glass as far as fatigue accumulation, response to stress. And so there is no perfect plan. There's the ability, you have to be able to create a structured approach to what you're going to accomplish, but have that plan ability to change based on your recovery. So, but if we wanna talk training, I can talk through the training principles that were put in place. Oh, I would love uh, that. And I know also that I wanna give credit to your team because I think your team is coaching you. <laughs> Yes. So uh, the entire four or five years leading up to this was entirely planned out by my team, which is so the coach that managed all my training variables was uh, our head uh, of our education, which is Brandon Sen. Um, Great guy. Uh, and I believe you have talked to Kyle. So Kyle okay. worked with a lot of the uh, recovery modalities that were that were used and there's a lot of different people that I use in the, in, in the course of that, but he was the one that was on a weekly basis checking alignment to the, you know, we would laser and ensure that uh, the, the joint positions, twists, things that are going on in the spine so that we had feedback, whether the work that we were doing would fix those issues and get me back into where I needed to be. Because the more time I spent not bound up in position, because guess what? I'm not perfect. I walked away from those sessions with some issues going on. Right. And we do? the sooner I could return to normal movement is a healer. Right. Yeah. And, but moving well, like just if you're, if you've got a limp or you're, you know, you've got things tight because you're back, like that movement isn't counting as much. Right. Because I have these huge amount of compensations that are built into it. And so, uh, so and yeah, the sooner, the sooner I return to norm, the better. So, so anyway, um, let, let's run through, let's You're run through, you. cause I think the training, so I'll just run through like the year long block leading in. So, um, there's obviously there was several years leading into the squat, but the training plan got specific, uh, about 11 months out. And the training got plan for the deadlift got very specific. I think it was planned. 
that might have been right around the same 11 months time frame out that we said, here's the date that we're going and here's the plan that we're going. You know, it was general and annual plan leading in, right, of development, but it was very specific from there. So what we did is look at towards the end, what do we want to be? What kind of, what, what do we know that I will be needing to be hitting as far as the load, the intensity, right? the frequency, all right, and the amount of volume. And then it was working backwards to getting there. So at the beginning, it's also looking, you're also looking at what are the individual strengths and weaknesses, Mm. what things need to be developed. So a year out from the squat, it's like, well, as we get, we're going to need to be able to manage and control the spine, right? So back strength, upper back strength, all these things with having that kind of load. And we're not going to be able to train those things heavily when we get to that period. So we did a lot of front loading of things. Um, uh, uh, So a mixed mixed vector movement, like a, a row was really critical. So where I'm having to maintain some level of axial, but also developing this front to back uh, buffering Ratio. and strength, right? So, been over a row. Walk, walk, uh, you, unilaterally or bilateral, you encompass both? I had those as well. So, we had pure just rowing movements, but like the bigger movement of the day would be a bent over row. Okay. It would be for the lower back, it would be good mornings. It would be, and then we pick movements, the specific movements related to the squat, right? Mm-hmm. They were further away from what the squat would be. And as we got closer, got more and more specific. But again, they're related to building those tolerances. So if you look at, at like nine months out, 10 months out, you'll see that I was using the transformer bar quite heavily, right? Yeah. And I, and I was working on increasing my frequency as a power lifter, I may only squat it really heavy a couple times a month. And then it was getting to squatting, sev- you know, slowly getting to squatting heavy weekly. And then adding more frequency, we got up to squatting twice heavy uh, during this period of time. Was that also to build more bone as well as a... Well, that's going to happen in the process, right? And that's something that's happened. That, that's something that happens over, over decades. But the more work that I can get done in the shorter period of time is going to result in more adaptation and more strength, okay? So we did the same thing in the deadlift. I went from a, a powerlifting approach where you're a heavy deadlifter of only pulling heavy a couple times a month to building to where I was doing it Gosh, weekly to building to where I was doing heavy. And then the second session was off of blocks and then slowly bringing it down to the floor to where I was finally uh, pulling heavy twice a week, once deficit and once off the floor. Um, On the squat, we found that because of the additional demands of the the load being up higher and the strain on, on the stabilization mechanisms, we actually towards the, the, the last, uh, four months or so back the frequency back off uh, because I wasn't able to to do those multi heavy sessions a week once the load got up there. That was the goal. We weren't able to accomplish it. And so we had to that's a, you know, that, work. That's a good point. Yeah. So, but earlier in the training we did. And so you'll see that I was hitting a couple heavy safety. I would do a safety squat bar session once a week, a good morning session once a week. So the transformer bar, I was doing very forward loaded. So again, that's going to require a huge amount of stabilization of the TL junction for upper back strength and a huge amount of on my, my, all my stabilizers, my core to be able to maintain those positions. When I was training, I started working up towards the end of those transformer bar sessions. I was close. So we started, again, this is the use of the transform bar. We started dialing those more and more specifically towards the squat sessions towards the end. But I was doing a couple sessions a week at over 800 pounds on the transformer bar. Uh, in I'd have one session was really aggressive and that was less weight. And then another was more towards a back squat, uh, type of loading pattern, uh, with, uh, with lesser, with, uh, with, with more weight. Um, 
And then we moved more specifically into the Duffalo bar, which is the bar I was going to squat in. If you don't have to use a straight bar, if you're not a barbell sport athlete, there is no reason that you should be using a straight bar to back squat, honestly. So there's just absolutely no reason, none whatsoever. And even if you are, look at what a lot of the top lifters like myself, Donnie Thompson, the first person to total 3,000 pounds. We have had discussions about this for a long time. He did the same thing as me. All his squatting year round was the curved bar and at the time, all that was available was the safety squat bar. I, both of us did the same thing. And then four weeks before a meet, we would switch over to a straight bar to just get used to it and then go in. And I, I, both of us had the all-time world record uh, for squatting, had the same approach because year over year, but go talk to uh, an Eddie Cohn and ask him why are his – what what was the impact of using a straight bar for squatting all those years destroyed his shoulders. Yeah. You can ask so many other guys that have done that. What did it end up doing over 20, over 20 years destroyed their shoulders, right? So if I can remove those stresses, get the same training effect and then get more specific when I need to. So, and this is how it relates to that conversation is the specificity uh, so we're starting with less specific that's getting the desired goal. And so we're periodizing the sure. movements towards the goal in each of those training blocks. We're working at what are the qualities that we're trying to develop. Okay. For me, it was ability to manage this core position, upper back strength. Those were the things that were the highest priority for me in the course of that to prepare for the training that was coming. So those are the qualities that we're doing. Uh, a lot of the training as we got closer. So you're <clears throat> earlier out or further out, I may have been doing some high volume, but then I would mix in, you know, every, three, four, five weeks, a heavier session to maintain the strength. So I wasn't restarting from ground zero. So it's, you know, taking a block uh, and then maintaining qualities from the prior block as you're developing new qualities. Okay. And then as you move into a new block, same thing, keeping some of those qualities from the, the, the prior block. So you don't have to do as much. The more advanced an athlete is the less time that you're, the less you, so with a, with a, uh, a lesser advanced athlete, you might every week or two still have to do a maintenance set for strength if you're in a, uh, in a hypertrophy um, zone. So you might still- the Adaptations on every block. And that's why yep. I usually say to people, enjoy the adaptations because that's what you need. But work on, you're working on building new qualities or adaptations, but doing a little bit of maintenance work here and there so that we maintain that. So then when we got to the final phases, so I was still doing some rowing. I was still doing some of these other things as I got closer and closer, but I was really tapering off the amount of work that I was doing so that my recovery resources could be dedicated to the increasing volume, the increasing intensity on the squat. And then in the final phases, it was nothing but squat. And I squatted heavy once a week and that was it. I did a couple sessions leading and I actually did a couple. I do two light BFR sessions, um, squatting, eat two, the, the two days leading into the squat to really fill out um, because I, because I lack the, the, the frequency and volume in my training at that point, I would, my muscle bellies would be flat going into that heavy training day if I didn't. So that was a combination of that along with a lot of use of nitrates. So Vasoblitz from my uh, build fast uh, formula company was huge in being able to maintain that, combine that with a little bit of a BFR. I do five sets of 20 with like one plate on the bar. And, just, uh, yeah. and I, so I may do, yeah, I think I did like three sets, uh, you know, with like 30, 40, 40 seconds rest, 20 reps. Then I'd rest for two to three minutes and do the same thing again. And then the next day I'd repeat again. And that was pretty close to my first warm up as well. But that would allow me to really fill out, be able to draw in all those nutrients I need and be ready for that heavy. It was just preparation for that heavy day. Also helped with recovery as well. Recovery as well. Because that was my other question about how did you recover from all this beating? You, you did an amazing, uh, amazing presentation about sleep. Uh, um, but also, how were you able to cope with, you know, training, family, 
Um, it, it, that was very challenging. So, uh, but I, uh, I got to warn you, I've got a call here in about four minutes. So I got to okay. get on to, yeah, yeah. but, but um, it's, it's incredible. When I reflect back at a couple months after the squat, I finally like woke up and I mean like, Oh my God, I was, I was in another world. Like I was not he, like, I was so in the moment in this haze, in this, whatever that I was not like here with the rest of us. I don't know how else to explain yeah. it. And it took a couple months for my recovery to come to a point where I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> welcome back to the world, Chris. <laughs> like, like, it's been going on without you. Uh, I was just in this little cloud, this little bubble of like just mental intensity, focus, like everything going on. I don't know how to describe it. It was crazy. Like it was, That's only it was, it was something else. Like, it, well, there was, I mean, I had to have that to do it, but also just, I, I was such a, also the mix of being a bit of a zombie from that level of, focus and training uh, leaves you like not able to manage all those other stuff as well. So I have to thank like my team, there's no way I could have done this without like sure. having a work environment th that was supportive of that. People understanding like, yeah, I was still involved in work, but I wasn't, I wasn't there. Like I wasn't, uh, I wasn't my normal self doing my normal things by any st stretch of the imagination. Chris, I know you're having a summit in February, and I'm going to post that because you've got great presenters coming up, uh, yourself as well. You're really looking forward to it, man. We've got 50, you know, very high level of presenters. You mentioned McGill. He's one of the, the many, many speakers that are going to be going over the course of the week. It is going to have live Q&A sessions at the end of every session. So uh, those that want to be able to uh, purchase the, the recordings post can, but I really think uh, you want to take advantage of uh, the live sessions as well as much as you can. Um, so we've got just power packed lineup. I really have not seen a better lineup of any event uh, oh, yeah. put on. So. Everybody is just, uh, I like all the speakers are amazing. I've already booked, um, uh, cause I'm not going to miss this. And I know we had a chat about you, uh, coming to Europe, uh, UK and Greece. Uh, yeah, we wanted to do it last year. Well, I guess that's this year now, man, 2020 has <laughs> been fun. Uh, oh, yeah. so, uh, the plans obviously got canceled. And so as soon as things open up, we, are, we, we, we want to make this happen. So, uh, really looking forward to this. It's something that people have been asking for, for a really long time. So, um, once we, once we get that planned, if you're listening you're going to go also make sure to let people know, um, so that we can uh, get a great audience and make sure that we're doing more events like this uh, abroad. We'll, and we'll, we'll warm them up with a web webinar we said we're going to uh, create uh, in February yep. uh, um, uh, summit. And I want to thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, and I'm looking forward for 2021 for all the nice things we're going to be doing. All right. Sounds great, man. I'm looking forward to working with you. Me too, Chris. Have a, have a right. lovely one. Enjoy. All right. Bye.